Hashem Namus. Dear Oli, and we welcome you in this uh, practical approach to common corneal infections. I would like to thank and welcome my dear professors uh, and colleagues, Professor Ahmed Al Masri and Professor Ala Ghis, who are well known, excellent surgeons and corneal experts. And uh, it's uh, a great pleasure to have this uh, webinar in collaboration between Alexandria University and the eye care center in Maadi. And we hope uh, that we can convey the message of a simple and basic approach to corneal in uh, infections, how to think about it and how to approach it and uh, what are the tools that we have to help our patients. So we will move ahead to Professor Ala Ghais, who will give us uh, uh, yeah, a nice talk about uh, how to identify different pathogens, the clinical pictures, how to approach the patients. So please, Dr. Ala, uh, go ahead. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Yahya. I'm very pleased to be uh, with you in such uh, an educational and uh, nice meeting, inshallah. Um, I also like to welcome Dr. Ahmed Al-Masri, who is my dear colleague and friend and and everything throughout our lives. Uh, and uh, I welcome also uh, and, and thank uh, Orchidia for such, uh, for continuing this good idea about uh, great minds, which uh, has, a, has a very good uh, message of uh, education to all uh, young ophthalmologists and uh, all practicing ophthalmologists. Uh, I will start my uh, lecture, not to waste any more time. <coughs> uh, sorry for that, this is not the... Uh, this is not the first uh, slide. We were do doing just some rehearsals. Uh, how can I get out of this? Okay, stop share. <coughs> This is my first slide. Um, uh, tips in the management of share, microbial share keratitis. Screen. Share a screen. Lift. It's not shared. Ah. Sorry. Okay, now. You yes. can see. Yes. yes. Okay. The objectives of this. Okay. The objectives of this lecture is to offer the attendees uh, a collection a collection of tips about the proper handling and management of a case of microbial keratitis in a systematic approach. Uh, I changed the, of course, the topic of microbial keratitis is a very big topic and it will take us a few hours to uh, give a lecture covering all the clinical picture and management and treatment of microbial keratitis. But I um, changed the, the scheme of the lecture so that it would be uh, in the form of tips and frequently asked questions from the uh, practicing physicians and ophthalmologists. First, uh, what are the causes of microbial keratitis? As we all know, we have bacterial, fungal, viral, and acanthamoeba keratitis, which are the main causes of uh, microbial keratitis. When we come to manage microbial keratitis, we uh, have to make an accurate diagnosis and to give a proper treatment. In order to reach an accurate di diagnosis, we have to pay attention to the clinical picture of the disease and also do some microbial eva microbiological evaluation if this is possible. 
The clinical picture includes history taking and a good thorough sleep important. Also, a sleep, exam, sleep lamp examination is of utmost importance. Uh, when you come to uh, history taking, you have to ask about the onset of the disease, how did it uh, occur and how fast it occurred, any predisposing factors, drug history, recurrence, history of recurrence, and medical history of the patient. Onset, uh, usually if it is acute within hours, it is a bacterial, uh, it's most likely to be a bacterial disease. Uh, acute, I mean, I mean within hours, the patient slept normal, then he woke up in the morning with severe pain. Gradual, meaning within one or more days, this can be fungal or viral. Of course, all what I'm seeing are uh, predictions. They are not sure things, but these are some collection of tips which guide you to reach uh, the diagnosis. Predisposing factors. You have to ask how to get an infection in the cornea. Uh, the cornea is protected. The cornea is protected by the epithelium, it's corrected, it's, uh, protected by the tears, by the lids, by many protective mechanisms. How did the, the microbe uh, make it? How did it make it to invade the cornea? There must be some epithelial breakdown. For example, a foreign body. A foreign body usually leads to a bacterial or a fungal infection. Uh, contact lens wear, unhygienic contact lens wear is a main predisposing factor in acanthamoeba, keratitis, bacterial, and fungal. The three of them occur, but never um, a viral keratitis. Sometimes I see patients coming with prescriptions uh, and they are contact lens wearers and they are diagnosed as viral. This is very rare. Dust or sand in the eye, moving, uh, walking in a storm or something, and then sand or dust come into the eye, and the patient rubs the eye. This is a predisposing factor for acanthamoeba keratitis. Fingernail, fingernail injury may cause fungal or bacterial keratitis. Trauma by plant origin is a very famous in factor. You have to ask the patient and take some time trying to reach a predisposing factor. Or to also swimming in a dirty still water may lead to a canthamoeba keratitis. Drug history. You have to ask the patient about what did he take before coming to your clinic or presenting in your clinic. If the, he has a history of no response to multiple antibiotic eye drops, this means it is a fungal. Prolonged use of steroids, topical steroids like patients with uh, grafts, uh, corneal grafts, may lead to fungal or viral keratitis, viral herpes simplex, of course. Recurrence, recurrence, history of recurrence is very pathognomonic of viral keratitis, herpes simplex keratitis. Also, it is possible to have a recurrent fungal keratitis after treatment, insufficient treatment. And also, a canthamoeba keratitis may have a history of recurrence. The patient receives a treatment and then he doesn't complain, it doesn't continue. He doesn't continue treatment, so he may reach we have uh, a recurrence of infection. Medical history, you have to ask the patient. Patients with diabetes mellitus are more prone to bacterial and fungal infections. Rheumatoid arthritis may lead to dry eye or immune related ulcers, which may become secondly infected by bacteria or fungi. Allergic Orders, allergic disorders uh, like vernal keratoconjunctivitis or uh, seasonal uh, allergy may lead to ulcers and this may become secondly infected. After taking a thorough history, you have to uh, pay attention to the clinical features. Clinical features, I mean symptoms and signs. Symptoms, symptoms you have to ask about pain. Pain is a very important feature of uh, microbial keratitis. 
and, uh, and I will speak about it now. Then sign, the signs of, this, of the disease, the lesion features, you have to ask about the size, to not ask, sorry, you have to uh, take a good look at the size, shape, epithelial defect size, and all these factors I'm listing here. I will come, uh, I will go through each one in separate. First, pain. Pain, if it's severe, it is a bacterial, a bacterial or a amoeba keratitis. Uh, pain is severe in a amoeba keratitis and usually in early stage, stages, it's not uh, correlating with the clinical feature in the cornea. The cornea is more or less uh, having small infiltration, very little infiltration and the pain is very high. Moderate pain is characteristic of fungal keratitis and not bacterial. Mild or absent pain is characteristic of herpes simplex keratitis. And also a very important feature that decreasing, decreasing pain means that the patient condition is improving in follow-up visits when you ask the patient means that your treatment is working. The size of the ulcer, uh, it can be uh, you know, described as small, one to two millimeter, medium, three to four millimeter, or large, bigger than five millimeters. Of course, it's important to characterize the size because it will be important in the management. Um, also shape. The shape of the lesion in, that, in, microbial, in microbial keratitis is, can be very helpful. For example, a dendritic appearance means it's a herpes simplex keratitis. Feathery edges means that the fungal, it's a fungal. Satellite lesions means that it is a fungal also, characteristic of fungal keratitis. Linear infiltrations, it's an acanthamoeba keratitis, very characteristic together with the ring-shaped infiltration. This like it can be a bacterial or fungal. For example, this patient on the, the picture on the left, it is a dendritic ulcer. It's uh, no way it to be mistaken as another entity other than uh, dendritic herpes simplex. Also the one on the right is a geographical ulcer, very characteristic. The photo on the upper left is a very characteristic photo fungal keratitis with feathery spiky edges and a hypopion, a small hypopion with uh, no uh, distinct upper border. The picture on the right, uh, right uh, lower right hand uh, lesion and another one which is uh, a small distance away from the main lesion, a small Multifocal lesion, this is a characteristic sign of uh, fungal Here we can see the linear uh, perineural infiltrations of, uh, of Akanth is a very also characteristic feature. Uh, good, uh, infiltration cornea and it is uh, as you can see the epithelial defect here the border of the epithelial defect is lots of uh, bacterial ulcers but in such case you are not sure whether this is bacterial or, or uh, fungal. The epithelial effect, epithelial effect you have to stain any patient with microbial keratitis and you have to correlate between the size of the epithelial defect and the size of the suppuration, the underlying suppuration. If uh, the epithelial defect is equal to the size of the suppuration, so this can mean any type of infection, bacterial or fungal. Uh, larger, if it, the, the epithelial defect is larger than the suppuration, as the previous photo, uh, it is a bacterial. Most light effect is smaller than the uh, underlying fungal uh, suppuration, so it is a fungal one. If there is no 
no epithelial defect absent, so it might be fungal or a cancamoeba or viral. Viral, of course, can happen in the form of stromal keratitis with no overlying epithelial defect. So the epithelial defect is a vital, vital issue, a vital uh, sign of infection. The site also may um, may be uh, may be indicative of the of the cause of the infection. If it's central, it may be bacterial or fungal, paracentral, any type or a viral. Also, peripheral may be immune related or any type of infection. The depth of infection may be superficial in viral or any type. Deeper ulcers are more likely to be bacterial or fungal. Suppurative lesion usually happens in bacterial or fungal infection or in pigment. Ha having pigment in the suppurative lesion is very characteristic of fungal infection, like these photos. Uh, having pigment within the suppurative lesion is highly suspicious highly indicative of fungal infection. Also, a very important uh, sign is the surrounding uh, cornea, the, the cornea surrounding the lesion. The, there may be some edema or cellular infiltration and clearing of this edema and infiltration is a very good uh, indicator of responding uh, lesions. It is responding to treatment when the the lesion becomes uh, the surrounding cornea becomes clearer. Vascularization, uh, if it happens while you are treating the patient, it means that you have a starting healing process. Vessels embedding the lesion are very um, important, uh, important uh, sign of healing. Uh, also, there are some additional signs like uh, lip edema, conjunctival chemosis, conjunctival injection, hypopion. Uh, all of these are severe in bacterial, moderate in fungal, and mild, very mild injection in viral. Uh, the hypopion also occurs only in bacterial or fungal keratitis. You have to pay attention to the upper border of the hypopion. If it is regular, so it is most like more likely to be bacterial. If it's irregular, this is, a, this is, this is very pathognomonic of fungal infection. For example, here, the left photo on the upper side is the, the, the hypopion has a straight, regular, upper horizontal level. It is most, most, more likely to be bacterial. The other picture on the right, you have uh, the hypopion is uh, pushed to one side and it has no uh, regular upper border, this may indicate a fungal infection. Uh, a very frequent, frequently asked question, is it possible to diagnose the etiology of microbial keratitis from the clinical picture? After I have discussed all these uh, items uh, about the symptoms, signs, and the clinic and history, so, uh, is it possible to diagnose the etiology of micro? This is the main question for many ophthalmologists. Let me tell you that the main dilemma in this uh, point is fungal. You can't, you can't be sure 100% that this is bacterial or fungal by only clinical picture. Viral keratitis usually has specific clinical signs which, can, which cannot be missed, herpetic, whether simplex or so, so characteristic. And adenoviral also uh, keratitis is very, uh, yani very characteristic for its sub-epithelial disc-like infiltrations. And it is uh, not to be uh, confused by bacterial and fungal. Acanthamoeba also keratitis has so uh, distinctive uh, Distinctive signs, uh, the perineural infiltrations, the, the ring infiltrates, and uh, it is hard to miss. Uh, it is missed because it is not in the mind of the ophthalmologist, but if you are looking for it, you will, you will easily diagnose it. Mixed infections are difficult to diagnose with certainty. Uh, huge infections are like failure of treatment. You, you treat a bacteria 
bacterial and bacterial keratitis and doesn't respond so you think about a mixed fungal and bacterial or viral and bacterial so uh, it comes uh, after the diagnosis comes after some time for example this patient you can't swear whether it is fungal or bacterial um, there are some discharge on the eyelashes uh, and on the cornea this discharge but there are so much infiltration in the cornea you can't know you can't know with certainty also this suture related uh, infection uh, it can be bacterial or fungal you cannot know you can't know without uh, lab investigation this one uh, infection after keratop after keratoplasty uh, it had a very characteristic spiky spiky uh, appear edges uh, it is very likely to be fungal, but this patient actually didn't respond to uh, treatment, antifungal, and I did him uh, lab e e e e microbiological evaluation. It proved to be candida, and it didn't respond also to treatment, so he had a re a regraft. This is also infection, marked infection, yes, swear. Uh, when the, the second question, uh, when should I refer the patient to microbiological evaluation? <clears throat> uh, you have to refer the patient if you have no response or worsening of the clinical signs after two, uh, two to don't wait more than that. Uh, cases with no previous antimicrobial treatment and in this unit, indefinite clinical picture. Uh, you fresh with no previous treatment, so it is a uh, evaluation do it. It's better for the patient, of course. Uh, microbiological investigation is done for bacteria and fungal species only. Uh, the lesions edge and base are scrapped with platinum spatula, chimura spatula. And the specimen is used in two ways, either, in two ways, not either, both of them. Gram staining on glass slides and uh, culturing on specific media to identify the organism and its antimicrobial profile. Microbiological, uh, and you, before you do it, you have to stop anti, topical antimicrobial treatment for at least two days and culture and sensitivity could be repeated after a few days in case of no response to the, recommend, to the recommended antibiotics or you have no initial yield. You, you can repeat the culture and sensitivity test if under those two situations. Uh, also a very important tip that if the results do not coincide with the clinical picture, there must be some contamination at the lab. Sometimes the, 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 the culture results are not correlating with the clinical picture you are seeing. So uh, the, these results are wrong and there must be some contamination at the lab. Uh, if you ask for microbial therapy, uh, which route of administration is the best? How frequent should I use them? And should I use commercially available antibiotics or fortified anti, uh, antibiotic eye drops? The route of administration, the topical route, is the preferred method, of course, in most cases, as, as it delivers high concentration of the drug, exceeding the minimum inhibitory con concentration of most organisms, bacterial, fungal, acanthamoeba, viral, all of them. Uh, topical is the main route. Frequency of eye drops. How, how frequent should I use the drops? If the condition is severe with deep stroma, millimeter of extensive loading dose every five to 15 minutes for the first hour, then every 15 minutes to one hour around the clock. Around the clock means 24 hours a day until you get a response. When you get a response and, and the patient and the lesion responds to treatment, you can uh, decrease the frequency. Commercially available or fortified eye drops. 
if both are available, uh, it's your choice. You can give this commercially available or fortified. For example, most studies concluded that there is no difference in therapeutic outcome between fluoroquinolones, eye drops, and combined broad spectrum fortified eye drops. This is an example, and many studies have concluded that. Also, most antifungal and anti-amoebic eye drops are not commercially available. You don't see them, you don't find them. You don't find them in the pharmacies. So this is a photo of, uh, this is a table showing the commercially available eye drops, uh, the aminoglycosides, topramycin and gentamicin, chloramphenicol, and the fluoroquinolones, the three generations. Of course, most of us are using the fourth generation fluoroquinolones, gatifloxacin and amoxifloxacin, and also uh, the fortified, uh, you can find only vancomycin in the fortified septazidine, which you are using. Most of us are using for the fortified. Also, you have any physician should know uh, the, the spectrum, the spectrum of the drugs he or she is using. Aminoglycosides are more effective against gram-negative uh, organisms, bacteria. Cephalosporins, the first generation are more potent against the gram-positive, while the third generation are more uh, active and potent against gram-negative. The fluoroquinolones, the fourth generation, are most active against most, uh, more active against uh, or equally active against both gram negative and gram positive. Antifungal treatment. We have many questions about antifungal treatment. Which antifungal eye drops should I use? Where can the patient find the drops? What is the proper concentration and dosage of the drops? And what is the exact shelf life of the preparation? And when should I stop antifungal treatment? D these are so important questions that I will try fast to answer them. Uh, Dr. Yahya, I think I passed my time. Um, uh, <laughs> um, I, I don't know. Uh, it's very interesting. I didn't yes. measure it. No, no, How long? It's 21 minutes should now, but you can. Yes, yes, 21? continue, please. 21, but no, it's very interesting. Only and, five uh, minutes left. Okay, take your Thank time. Thank you, Dr. Okay. Ahmed. Thank you for the encouragement. I don't want to be a heavy lecturer or a, a boring no, one. Uh, okay. We, we need, uh, need If you have... Uh, now, nah, um, antifungal therapy uh, for filamentous fungi, the aspergillus and the... And the fusarium, you, neptamycin is the drug of choice for these uh, organisms, but you can use also amphotericin B, AMB, voriconazole, and fluconazole. For the yeasts, especially the candida, uh, the amphotericin B uh, is the drug of choice with alternative like, alternatives like fluconazole and voriconazole. Uh, Natamycin, natamycin, or approved by the FDA for topical keratitis. It is the drug of choice in any suspected corneal fungal infection, like uh, fusarium, spergillus, and candida albicans. It is a 5% uh, suspension and uh, can be used for every one to two hours intervals for the first three to four days, followed by reduction of the dose to every three to four hours when a clinical response is obtained. And treatment should be continued, continued for three to four weeks. Amphotericin B is uh, famous for the name, trade name fungi zone. Uh, it is uh, active against candida and filamentous fungi. It is a broad spectrum antifungal for all organisms. Uh, the preparation is prepared in 0.15% uh, concentration, and uh, you have to use terrine water as a solvent, not saline or BSS, as they precipitate the drug in solution and all should be kept in dark bottles, uh, ruined by light, and refrigerated to avoid drug disintegration. The shelf life 
is between 24 and 72 hours. Uh, doctors uh, and physicians and pharmaceutical uh, authorities give us uh, conflicting uh, data about the shelf life of amphotericin B preparation. Some say 24 hours only, some say three days. Uh, I, myself, I use it for three days and discard the rest. Uh, dissolve, uh, you have to dissolve 50 milligram vial in 10 milliliters sterile water, and then you withdraw three milliliters and add to them another seven millimeters of sterile water to get a concentration of 0.15%. This is the way how to prepare it. Triazoles uh, are fungistatic and less effective when treatment is delayed. For examples of triazoles, we are using fluconazole, known as diflucan's trade name, itraconazole, sporanox, and voriconazole, vifent. Fluconazole is used uh, as it is, as it is, as it is uh, available at the pharmacy. Uh, it, is, it is more effective against candida. Itraconazole, uh, Sporanox, we give it systemically in, in, in 100 milligram tablets, and the usual dose is 100 to 200 milligrams, uh, one or two times per day. Uh, it is again, it is also a, a more effective against uh, Candida and Aspergillus. Voriconazole, Voriconazole, known in our market here in Egypt as defend and you can give it to the patient as topical uh, eye drops uh, preparation, 1% solution, 10 milligram per milliliter. It is, uh, you dissolve 200 milligram vial in 19 milliliters of uh, uh, water for injection. And I'm writing here the price because it is relatively uh, expensive, but it is uh, as, as uh, effective as amphotericin B in fighting fungal keratitis. Oral, you can give it oral, but it is not, um, it is not effective. It is not usually effective for, kerat for keratitis, but you can give it, but it's too expensive. It's very expensive. It is, uh, it is actually effective against all types of uh, fungal keratitis. The last uh, few slides, uh, management of acanthamoeba keratitis. What is the best treatment for acanthamoeba keratitis? And where should I find the treatment? How long should I continue the treatment? And what should I do if the patient is not responding to anti- uh, First, you have to look at Drophozoid, which is a metabolically active mobile infection form and a cyst form which is resistant to heat, cold, dryness and pH uh, extremes and medical treatment. It is also resistant to medical treatment. Uh, it can stay dormant for months for months and then if, they, if the condition in the environmental condition improve it changes into trophozoid. The two uh, main important drugs for anti-amoeba are the pro propamidine acetionate, broline. Uh, it can be given alone or in combination with aminoglycosides, uh, natamycin, fet fetoconazole, or itraconazole. Uh, it is used topically per hour for weeks to months. Uh, and you have to uh, continue treatment with this drug for uh, months and not weeks even. It causes superficial punctate keratopathy. The, the other important drug in, as an anti amoebic drug is polyhexamethylene begonite, PHMB, famous for the name, trade name, Bacquasil. It, you can give it as 0.02% or 0.04% or 0.06%. It is trophocidal and cysticidal. So it is actually a very potent drug. Uh, it is an active ingredient in swimming pools cleaning product called uh, Bacosil, and it is not uh, commercially available. It has to be prepared. It can cause also pupillary reaction and toxicity. Uh, other anti amoebic drugs, chlorhexidine, uh, it is very effective against the uh, it is also cysticidal and uh, trophocidal uh, and has to be prepared, less toxic than PHMB. You can give neomycin eye drops, but it's very weak. 
uh, oral antifungals can be given for aerobic effect. You have to follow the patient after giving the treatment, the antimicrobial treatment. You have, can modify your initial therapy when there is lack of improvement or stabilization within 48 hours. And you have to modify also your initial therapy according to the results of culture and antibiotic sensitivity test. Some important tips after, before I finish. Very important tips, actually. They are even more important than all of what I have said. Patient compliance. The patient should take one drop of each type of drops on the top of the cornea, and at least five minutes should elapse between different eye drops, and you don't stop treatment until the next visit and renew or refill empty drops because some patients, their drops are finished before the follow-up visit and they stop it until you they come. So tell them clearly, don't stop treatment until I, the next visit. Storing of the eye drops should be stored cool in a cool place, for example, down in the refrigerator and they have to re be replaced in time. 45 drops every four to seven days. Uh, also, the patient should be educated about the disease process. Uh, some talk, you have to talk with the patient and his relatives or her relatives about the disease process. How did the organism invade the cornea, the necrosis which will happen, and the tissue response to treatment. Also, the long duration of treatment and importance of compliance. The patient usually gets fed up and he doesn't want to continue treatment because he is bored, he is uh, depressed, he is afraid. So you have to encourage him or her to continue the treatment and give them hope in cure. Additional measures also should be given to the patient like vitamin C in large doses, Eye lubricants, uh, cycloplegics when there is accompanying uh, aridocyclitis, and analgesics are so important to make uh, the, the patient's life easier. And also in IOP reducing agents if the patient is uh, having increased intraocular pressure. The last question in my lecture is when can I use topical corticosteroids in microbial keratitis? This issue is highly controversial, but you can use uh, topical corticosteroids after control of the disease by the antimicrobial agents. You, you can start topical steroids uh, after you get a response to your antimicrobial agents or agents. And also you have to give it with an adequate antimicrobial cover. You don't stop the antimicrobial. You have to give the highest dose of antimicrobial with a, a, a small concentration of topical steroids. Uh, you have to give it also on cessation of clinical improvement after initial favorable response to antimicrobial agents. Sometimes the patient responds and then the, the condition stops. It doesn't improve, it doesn't get cured, but it doesn't get worse. So you can give the steroids in such as to decrease tissue and scar. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you for this. <laughs> thank you, Dr. Ala, for an excellent presentation. For this important topic that we see a lot of, our pay, uh, of, uh, of these patients in our practice, and uh, in casualty uh, uh, rooms in our hospital. So it's very important to have a, gui a guide how to move through these cases. And uh, I have, we will have very rapid, fa uh, short questions from the audience. Just, uh, I, I have one comment. You mentioned about the cornea sc scraping and the culture. Can you clarify? When exactly the, is it related to the size of and the depth of the ulcer, or each patient can be uh, cultured when he presents? Second, you talked about the gram staining, and uh, you did not talk about the KOH, uh, potassium hydroxide staining, which is very useful now as a simple method to identify um, fungal infections where you can see it well stained and if it is positive so it, you reach the diagnosis 
until the culture results uh, comes back. And if it's negative, you are doing culture anyway. So can you rapidly comment on the KOH use? When exactly to clarify to the audience, you should do uh, microbiological, microbiological scraping and culture. Uh, about the KOH, uh, of course, it's a very simple and rapid tool to identify fungal infections. And uh, I, I use it actually a lot, but the scope of the lecture didn't allow me to uh, go in details about the microbiological diagnosis. But yes, this comment is very uh, important. And KOH is a very important tool in diagnosis, uh, in microbiological diagnosis. About when, when... Um, uh, I've mentioned in the lecture that you do microbiological evaluation uh, if the patient comes to you uh, receiving no treatment, no previous treatment. So this is the perfect timing to do uh, a culture for a suppurative lesion. If you have uh, a cantamoeba or viral uh, suspicion, you don't do that. You don't do a microbiological examination for these patients. Uh, but uh, for um, and do you have to stop the treatment for two days? You said one to two days or two days, and is it safe is, to stop the treatment? This is the other, other situation. situation when the patient comes to me receiving a lot of uh, previous unsuccessful treatment. So I have to stop it for at least two days. Three days might be better, but sometimes the in, the, the first culture becomes negative, come no result, sterile. So uh, I can repeat the initial uh, culture. I can repeat it after two, another two or three days. If the patient's condition allow, if the patient is not at a very severe, dangerous uh, situation, of course, of being perforated or something like that. So uh, I do it after some time of stopping the treatment. Thank you, Dr. Ala. <clears throat> we, يعني, there is a lot of, uh, of course. discussion. It needs, it's a big topic, but you have summarized it in a very nice way, very useful way. So now we will move the scenario further. So the patient came to you. You tried to diagnose him, as Dr. Ala said. You tried to do your best giving medical treatment, but the patient is not responding. So what are the options? We will start with Professor Ahmed El Masri. Uh, the chairman or head of thermology department, Alexandria University, and he will take us in a journey in the value of cross-linking in corneal infections, which is becoming a very uh, hot and useful topic that we are going to hear. And there is improvement also in the technology to make it easier and more accessible to treat such patients. So, Professor Ahmed, please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Dr. Yahya, for uh, the invitation for this uh, webinar, and thank you for Orchidia, and it's uh, the honor and pleasure for the um, ophthalmology department in Alexandria University to share with the eye care and Orchidia, the great minds for the year 2020, the first wave. I know that you know that there will be a second wave. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ala, for this very nice uh, lecture, really. Uh, all of us enjoyed it, and we know that it's a lengthy lecture, and you try to summarize it as much as you can. And um, of course, uh, thank you for uh, Orchidia for all of the time supporting us for these webinars. And uh, my talk will be short and to the point, talking about one point is the corneal cross-linking for infectious keratitis, which really made a big difference for the management and the treatment of the uh, corneal ulcers, especially uh, early. Before starting, again, I would like to thank, first, I, I'm, I'm, I'm stressing that I don't have any financial interest for uh, the materials of this um, lecture. And I'd like to thank uh, Professor Farhat Hafizi, who uh, assisted me a lot in, the, in this presentation with his group uh, for supplying material slides for this presentation. So to start with, we know that uh, corneal cross-linking was uh, first developed in Germany, and then in Italy, 2005, they started doing it for um, uh, keratoconus and other corneal ectasia. And in Alexandria, we were um, honored to be the first to do it in the Middle East, in Egypt, and especially in Alexandria with Dr. Osama Ibrahim. And I, we, did the, we did the first cases 
uh, on 2007. It's now 13 years follow up of these cases. And of course, in the USA, there were, there were limited clinical trials that had been approved again in 2010. All of us know that the usual indications of cross-linking is the progressive keratoconus, the iatrogenic ectasia, the pellucid margin degeneration, recurrent keratoconus after corneal graft, which is markedly seen. And I do advise all the corneal surgeons to do pentacam for their grafts because you may find there is a weakness of the graft and the graft may need uh, cross-linking after a few years. <clears throat> Again, the pseudophagic bullous keratopathy and the uh, Athens protocol, which is not our concern, but our concern in this lecture is the infectious corneal ulcers. What is the PEC cross-linking? Simply cross-linking is for infective keratitis, whether uh, bacterial or fungal or fungal or acanthamoeba, but it's contraindicated for the viral. Uh, so be careful just to exclude that, um, uh, that the patient has a viral uh, corneal ulcer. Accelerated cross-linking for 180 seconds, just two and a half minutes, that will save the eye and will save a lot of treatment for this patient. Uh, it started in 2008 in Switzerland by the Hafizi group, and many eyes were saved by the PEC cross-linking, which is considered as a sight-saving procedure now, and now in Sweden it is the primary treatment, and the mechanism of action for this cross-linking in infectious keratitis is totally different from the, that of the uh, in, um, in keratoconus. So the PAC cross-linking effect simply, we know that the ultraviolet rays plus the riboflavin, they act as a disinfectant. If you bring a bottle of water and just put it in the sun for six hours, it will be, you can drink it and it will be sterile with the ultraviolet rays. With the riboflavin, this combination acts as a disinfectant. Again, we all know that uh, antimicrobial resistance is much, much increasing nowadays. And we reached just the fourth generation of fluoroquinolones, as Dr. Ala said, but still the resistance is marked and the resistance is high and it is every day appears. Again, if we take the whole problem from the economic point of view and from the uh, actual affection on the patient, it is more than six to eight millions um, could be affected or affected with coronary ulcer all over the world. And it's a definitely leading cause of blindness and the anti antimicrobial resistance is arising. So the number of drugs that can treat these ulcers is getting less. Bacterial or fungal could be treated and the costs. Of course, the cost of this antibiotic and as uh, Professor Ala said, the um, perseverance or the compliance of the patient to take the treatment in the proper time, as you hear it for the acanthamoeba, every hour for two weeks continuously that's really boring and psychologically affecting and costly uh, for, uh, for these patients. So um, uh, the PAC cross-linking that had been invented or discovered or uh, discussed in 2014 by Farhat Hafiz and Bradley Randleman and had been um, uh, um, published in the Journal of Refractive Surgery is, um, or is um, a clue for the photoactivated chromophore for keratitis. Photoactivated means it's activated with light Chromophore means any substance that gives um, color, and this is the treatment for keratitis. The difference of the action of the cross-linking in the keratoconus and infection. In keratoconus, there is a biomechanical stiffening of the cornea that results in a steric hindrance and stiffness of the collagen. But in infection, there is an added DNA and RNA intercalation that results in oxidative stress and results in stiffening of the cornea and decrease the digestion of the uh, collagens. So simply, the mechanisms in both of them is similar, but in the PEC cross-linking, we add the intercalation with the DNA and RNA and the oxidative stress that results from this action. This oxidative stress with the intercalation result in the steric hindrance and increased resistance to digestion. And please stress on this statement the resistance to digestion because it will result later in less scar that will be left from the scar that are given from the uh, antimicrobial treatment. So both of them, they act as a disinfectant. But it has a limit because if we leave the patient for the advanced cases, which are nearly melting the cornea, there is no difference between the PEC cross-linking and the antimicrobial 
treatment for these uh, cases. And thus, uh, the most important message, please do cross-linking as early as you can if there is no response of infection or if there is no, if there is no response to antibiotic within two or three days. So the PAC cross-linking is an alternative technique to medical treatment. And this accelerated PAC cross-linking started phase one, 180 seconds at 30 milliwatt and with antibiotics. And this is what we are doing now. And phase two, just two arms, one antibiotics and the other arm with antibiotics and PAC cross-linking. And the phase three was two arms again one antibiotic and the other only PAC cross-linking, which up till now I didn't dare to do just PAC cross-linking. I'm giving antibiotics for these patients also. So this is a Swiss multicenter study comparing the two arms of one antibiotic alone and the other is uh, PAC cross-linking alone. All of us know this picture and it is the time versus power uh, and results for the um, uh, fluence of the, um, or the affection 5.4 Joule per cubic centimeter is the aim or the goal for the energy that reaches the cornea. And we found that the two, two and a half minutes with 36 milliwatt will give the 5.4 joule per cubic centimeter and is more than effective, exactly like the Dresden protocol of 30 minutes with three milliwatt per cubic centimeter and uh, for the infectious keratitis in the pack cross-linking. So this had been simplified with slit lamp cross-linking I don't have any financial interest for this machine. It's the CI device, which had been um, marked now by imaging company. It has different intensities and uh, it could be uh, mounted on slit lamp. And this will save place because all of the time we're a little bit afraid for the patient with infection to go to the OR. So just simple uh, isolated room with the slit lamp and the cross-linking machine uh, that uh, could be mounted in the sit lamp, and it also could be mounted on table like the usual one. It uh, depends on the more, which is more comfortable for the patient, and has different ranges of intensity, whether pulsed or continuous, and uh, it, it's again adjusted to the thickness of the cornea, which is an important point for the um, uh, infected cornea. And it had been launched last year in the ESRS in 2019 in Paris. Um, simply, they did a study to compare which is um, more responding to treatment. Definitely, the smaller the size of the ulcer, the better will be the result. For ulcers of 1.8 millimeter, the, the results will, uh, the treatment will be in a shorter time than with larger results. The bacterial and fungal, both of them work uh, efficiently and even in the mixed cases and in the acanthamoeba cases. From this slide, just one, we want to uh, stress on one thing that cross-linking is depending on the oxygenation. So oxygen is essential for successful cross-linking. So um, this is a very important point. And uh, just to stress, even in the uh, conventional cross-linking, oxygen should be enough for the cross-linking to be successful. The PAC cross-linking as an alternative to medical treatment, this is one of my cases of post keratoplasty mixed fungal and um, acanthamoebal infection for a lady of about uh, 65 or 70 years of age after successful keratoplasty for, with, um, for more than seven months. Then she developed the infection and I did her cross-linking. And this is the picture after one month. Yes, there is some thinning of the cornea, but definitely the infection had been controlled. And after six months, the cornea is becoming more and more clear with very mild scar. Uh, this patient did combine DALC and FECO, and uh, we are assessing now the visual uh, acuity to see whether she will need uh, uh, to do another DALC or not. This is another very poor and miserable lady that I did her combined FECO and uh, trabic electrum since more than 15 years. She was doing well, but she was immune compromised with fungal infection in her toes, and she has bilateral fungal corneal ulcers. I did her bilateral pack cross-linking at the same setting. And this is the picture after a few months. As you see, still the hygiene of the patient is not to the level, but the, the eye had been saved from the infection. This is the right eye. And this is her left eye after the cross-linking again with a few months. So 
uh, another point to be discussed is the rate of epitalization of the coronary ulcer. As uh, Dr. Ala said, there is a relation between the size of the deepitalization and the type of the ulcer. The bacterial, the um, deepitalized area is larger than the infection. The fungal <coughs> or acanthamoeba are nearly the same or less. So again, Hafizi group, they did a comparison between the time to coronary epitalization with Pecros linking as a first line of treatment in early infectious coronary ulcers compared to the current standard of care with antimicrobial therapy. And they found that the rate of epitalization or the time of epitalization is definitely longer in the PEC cross-linking than the regular ones. But again, we save the patient from a lot of drugs in spite of having a longer time of epitalization of the surface for a few days. And in the meta-analysis to compare between the diameter of the ulcer and the mean epitalization time, of course, the smaller the ulcer, the less time to be taken for these uh, ulcers to be uh, re-epitalized. This is another case of um, one eyed 85 year old uh, male patient that had uh, penetrating keratoplasty in his right eye again for three or four months with clear cornea. And then he started to develop this kind of infection, which looks like early fungal infection with bacterial one. And uh, this was on the uh, January 2020. And then I started treatment with him. As you see, there is more, um, uh, the lesion increased and it become more frank of having bacterial and fungal infection after doing the um, culture and sensitivity for this patient. And on 22nd of January, I decided to do cross linking for him. And in spite of having the cross linking or the pack cross linking late for this patient, and this is 10 days later, starting to um, minimize or to uh, uh, have the lesion well circumscribed and to be under control with clearer cornea at the periphery. And just last week, he came to me or a few days ago with the, as you see, the cornea is becoming more clear. The haze is much, much less. The patient started to regain vision. So it's a really a method that we can save the eye with um, less amount of uh, antibiotics. So. To conclude, uh, PEC cross-linking followed by antimicrobial therapy might be an alternative for infectious coronary infiltrative and, and early coronary ulcers, even with a tendency for a longer healing time. As you said before, 85% of eyes treated with the PEC cross-linking healed without the use of antimicrobial therapy. And the earlier, the better. Once you diagnose the coronary ulcer uh, uh, and to do the PEC cross-linking, the response <coughs> is much, much better. Pecros thinking alone seems to have similar efficacy as combined uh, treatments. And in the future, the antimicrobial resistance will increase. So alternatives should be present. Pecros thinking does not only kill, but it increases the resistance to digestion. This is a very important point to stress on that there is a, there will be less scar with the uh, Pecros thinking due to the less, the increased resistance to digestion. Many areas of the world, the doctor's costs are limiting. Pecros linking reduces follow-up time, and there is less dependent on the doctor's experience whether to know this type of ulcer just to do the culture and sensitivity. And it kills both the bacteria and fungi and the acanthamoeba, and it helps to reduce overall microbial load that needs to be addressed by antimicrobials. And in conclusion, now treat early use in all cases of bacterial, fungal, and mixed infections, and acanthamoeba, use in the doctor's office, and in the future, we should increase the fluence or the energy that will result up to 15 millijoule per um, <clears throat> uh, second, and the use of other comforts could be done. And before thanking you for staying with us, just to show what happens if the patient is left for late stage of healed coronary ulcer. Um, just show this in order to not to wait for the patient too much because you may face this. This is a four minutes video just to show you what will happen if the cornea is melted and there is adhesion. This is a 35 year old uh, male patient that I did for him uh, PKP and then he went to his country and he got infection and he had been treated and came back to me with this situation the cornea is melted with the, and uh, amalgamated with the iris and um, the vision is hand motion. I did him 
uh, ultrasound, of course, and EEG and VAP, and trying to do a corneoscleral graft for him. And it was a, a disaster and very difficult surgery that uh, took about one and a half hours and trying to find the plane through, from the cornea to, uh, to separate the iris from behind. Uh, of, course, the ten, of course, the tension was controlled with all measures. I know that the pressure um, will be compromised after this surgery, but the patient can have a place to put a valve later on after doing the surgery. Of course, the plan was to put a corneoscleral graft and here I'm trying to uh, de-shelf the cornea from the iris, but still I didn't find the plane for the iris. This is the corneoscleral graft, trying to fashion it uh, to the area that will be put. So uh, keeping the cornea and part of the sclera and um, fashioning the corneoscleral graft um, uh, all around, because this will uh, be the only way to replace this cornea. You cannot put a terrifying on this patient. You will get the whole cornea with the iris. If you're trying to put terrifying, you cannot suture cornea to cornea. So you, the, you don't have any other alternative except to suture the sclera into sclera. So after fashioning to be prepared for uh, uh, putting it on the cornea, knowing that uh, this patient is uh, signing a consent that self-evisceration would happen uh, during the surgery, uh, and what's more interesting is still not yet reached that after removing of the cornea that is adherent to the back of the to the iris and still you are opening in something that you don't know what will be the result then after removal of the cornea you'll find another another very sh uh, hard shell of part of the cornea that is adherent to the iris so after removal of the whole cornea and uh, uh, finding this hard part of the rest of the cornea that is adherent to the lens <clears throat> and trying to remove it and then after it you'll find that the lens is totally opaque so there is a lens and there is a cornea and there is an iris so uh, what to do for this lens is another challenging case i did trip and blue to do capsular rexes i know that the lens is um uh, inflated so it's easy to do Argentina flex sign aspirating the lens matter from the anterior capsule and before getting the Argentina flag because of the lens matter I'm trying to do the capsule rexes as fast as I can and I succeeded to do the capsule rexes and then uh, delivering the nucleus and uh, what's behind is astonishingly a very clear red reflex with a clear uh, posterior segment and there is a bag that I could put the intraocular lens in, um, inside the bag, and then I put the corneal sclera graft. Again, the question of controlling the IOP is still a big question, but the patient knows that uh, it's a um, chance surgery, and uh, putting after that the corneal sclera graft and taking the sutures of um, uh, 80 uh, silk to the, uh, uh, the sclera, and to fashion the periphery of the cornea and uh, taking the sutures, and this is the end picture and removal of the flaringa ring and suturing the conjunctiva and having an eye with the cornea and sclera and an intraocular lens and some of the iris. And the patient is uh, followed up with about counting finger um, vision. And this is the sequel of um, not doing the uh, cross-linking as early as you can to avoid these disastrous uh, surgeries and unknown results. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank, thank you. you, Dr. Ahmed. Excellent uh, presentation as usual. But uh, I would like to sum up a little bit now. This is a yani, mindset changing progress that all of us should do. And we know that these patients are usually miserable and the problem that these patients go from one doctor to another doctor to a third doctor and usually come to the more experienced corneal surgeons very late, which is not the aim. What we need to, uh, to give as a message to the people that medical treatment, as Dr. Ala said, if it's not getting results, we follow what Dr. Ahmad Al-Masri advised. Now we have the cross-link, like cross-linking have filled the gap between hard contact lenses in keratoconus and keratoplasty. This is a really important thing. 
in the development by Farhad Hafizi of a simpler machine that can be even mounted in slit lamp will allow more reach. We see in Egypt a lot of these patients and particularly in tertiary hospitals and usually the present late. So if we have availability and understanding of how to tackle these patients, I think cross-linking can bridge a gap and prevent a lot of the patients from progressing. It is thinking about the timing. So thank you, Dr. Ahmed, for stressing okay. this excellent presentation and the principle okay. is very, very clear. So, uh, so much. And can I have a question? And the excellent mm, surgery, yes, of course. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Father, can I ask Dr. Ahmed a question, please? Sure. Um, sure. Actually, it's a very in interesting uh, lecture, but uh, for the for the main um, for the you know, the the regular ophthalmologist, uh, in in short, uh, which cases do you recommend us to do uh, cross linking exactly specifically? Which cases, and um, what are the settings now without uh, until we reach Dr. Hafiz's uh, this is a new device. Uh, what can we do with the current devices? Uh, what uh, settings should we be, we be using? Uh, simply uh, what we can do, Dr. Ala, is um, once we have corneal ulcer, yes, all of us are not yet uh, have the courage to do immediate cross-linking. So if you start the antibiotic treatment, if for my now, my decision is if the patient does not improve within one week, I'm doing cross-linking for him. What we do for cross-linking is simply the, the classical Dresden protocol. Simply, it works three uh, uh, milliwatt per minute, uh, every three minutes for half an hour with riboflavin for half an hour. If you even do the, your classical protocol of, um, of uh, the cross-linking and the Dresden protocol, it works perfect. I know a lot of colleagues now are doing the classical dressing protocol for infective uh, corneal ulcers. You have the other parameters. You can do accelerated. You can do, uh, of course, that there is no role for epi or for epi on because with the corneal ulcer, you don't need to remove the epithelium because the epithelium is already uh, absent. So you just put the riboflavin and you do uh, uh, every five minutes for half an hour, and then you can do your classical dressing protocol or the accelerated one as usual, so there is no big difference, but what we are saying for the sake of time later, it could be uh, with the higher fluence to be for two and a half minutes with the higher power later on. So simply I understand. in protocol, mm -hmm. exactly, without removing the epithelium you. because the epithelium. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I understand you are speaking about fungal and bacteria, not yes. anything else. The fungal, fungal and, and the bacteria, the same, the same thing. Yeah, nothing, the same about, thing for the, nothing about the size of the ulcer or the depth of the ulcer. Of course, the, the smaller the size of the ulcer, the better will be the result, the less will be the scar. So the hmm. earlier the, the intervention, the better the results. This is the main message. I and, know that it to, to, to reach this point of having cross-linking for a patient with corneal ulcer, it needs courage because we are not adapted for this. All of us who are starting the antibiotic, hoping to do improve, trying to convince ourselves it's improving, but definitely start as early as you can once you find whether bacterial, fungal, or even a amoeba. The only contraindication is for the viral infection. Dr. Ahmed, we have also yeah, in some yeah, experience for a few years now uh, on using cross-linking. And I agree with you, if, if you start earlier, it's definitely better. But also, sometimes patients presenting late using cross-linking will help you control better with the antibiotics. That's right. And uh, this is our experience, and I think it's a, a must. But also, we don't want people to overuse cross-linking unnecessary but it has a real role and that's what i'm going to take over from dr ahmed al masri the patient came to dr ala medical treatment and unfortunately he didn't follow with dr ala they can progress like dr ahmed case we don't want we have 
and the problem of patients usually can present up to one month from initial treatment, having all sorts, sorts of antibiotics, topical treatment, which increases the, the toxicity to the epithelium, which is a risk factor for har uh, harboring or helping infection to spread having an epithelial loss. So it's the, what we want to reach in this uh, uh, webinar uh, from every uh, talk we have heard up till now and this talk, it's all about decision. It's all about timing. The decision is dependent on knowledge and knowledge should be applied according to the rules, the experience, and the, you give everything in a timely manner. You give the antibiotic in the proper time. You do the culture in the proper time. You evaluate the progress of the, the condition in the proper time to move from medical treatment to cross-linking or medical treatment and cross-linking. And if this does not work enough, you have to take a decision. You don't. You should not be afraid to postpone all the time of the patient. I'm just uh, adding of what Dr. Ahmed said uh, about the surgical interference. We, we interfere either with cross-linking like this patient, and the, we have a lot of experience, but many of the experience of the corneal infections we treat either our contact lens related, and a lot of them are fungal, all aggressive or uh, virulent bacteria, or post refractive surgery. Unfortunately, we see a lot of these patients, and of course, trauma and other uh, uh, causes. But I'm going to share with you some cases, and this just to show you that this patient, after LASIK, who had an infection, he re was referred to us and he had all uh, uh, possible antibiotics even after culture. They amputated the graft, and then we thought of cross-linking, and you can see after one week of the flap amputation, still there is an infection. Then after cross-linking, two days after cross-linking, vascularization increasing, and the ulcer is less. You can see after one week, after two weeks, after two months, and after five months, has almost cleared. This was site saving procedure. Using cross-linking in the proper time would save the patient for more penetration of the organism, for more scar for, from more scar formation at the end when he heals. So this is very uh, useful tool. But sometimes the patient presents later on and you have to do surgery and you have to take the decision in the proper time. Unfortunately, many of the times, the main treatment is uh, penetrating keratoplasty. Some cases which are lucky, we can do lamellar keratoplasty, but the whole issue in these patients that they take treatment for a long time. And then when treatment is failing, the doctors they go to, they tell them, now you will need keratoplasty, penetrating keratoplasty, but we cannot do it until the eye is quiet. This is the major mistake. And we will see examples now. The major mistake, why? Because you have an abscess, you have to drain, drain, drain the abscess. The eye will not get quiet if the infection is not controlled. And if it is not controlled by medication or cross-linking, then the only solution for this patient is to remove the diseased part, is to remove the infected part and replace it with another healthy uh, cornea. So I will go through with you with some uh, scenarios. And this is just uh, one of the uh, publications that shows the timing. Yeah, it gives you like a guideline when to do keratoplasty. It's a guideline. You don't have to follow it. May, sometimes you can interfere earlier if your clinical judgment is so. Is so but it looks as the, at the infiltrate depth, the infiltrate and scar size, visual acuity, occupation of the patient, if it's related to fungal yeah, agriculture, and the degree of hypopion. And they showed that the size, large size of the ulcer and infiltrate, and the infiltrate going posterior one third of the stroma and the hypopion are high risk that you should do penetrating keratoplasty because this is mainly fungi and fungi usually tend to penetrate and go deep. And we will see examples. I will go directly into the cases. This is a 19 years old male patient. He presented with 
persistent severe cornea infection, pain. He cannot open his eye. He had earlier PRK, photorefractive keratotomy, and the, on taking the history of the patient, he didn't go for proper follow-up to the doctor, the surgeon who did the surgery. And unfortunately, the surgeon was prescribing to him a topical anesthetic that the young man kept using it like three weeks or four weeks post-operative and he presented to me uh, with infection that we cultured and it showed it is a spragellus. Infection, late infection like this, unfortunately, these are the worst prognosis, but you have to deal with it. It's almost melted. It's uh, very large, but you have to remove this. The worst thing uh, in uh, the worst surgical results when the fungal infection or the infection infiltrates into the eye and you will see how the uh, fungal infection, if you leave it, you don't treat it in the proper time, it gets into the anterior chamber, it gets behind the iris, it gets around the lens, and it's extremely difficult to remove. You can see how the exudates are stuck over the lens in this young child, a young, young man, going to do a refractive procedure. You will see the same example with contact lens were malused, as Professor Ala have showed before. So this, I'm trying my best. I cannot remove the whole cornea. I don't want to go into corneus clearer graph. He's young, possibility of rejection and melt is high. And even if you have still, always your objective is to remove the whole of the infected areas. If you cannot remove it, all of it, still you can, even if there is a rim, you can help it post-operatively with a topical treatment, specific treatment. I'm trying to release the synechia in the anterior chamber angle. I'm putting a graft and always as a rule in infected corneas, if you do graft, use uh, interrupted sutures, interrupted sutures because there's a differential healing. So sutures will get loose in one part faster than another part. And consequently, you have the option to uh, to remove it selectively. He came later on, four to six months later, until we, he presented with this uh, picture, we decided the intraocular pressure was high, and still we tried to give him a second chance of keratoplasty. And as you can see, it's not only the cornea, it's vasculized, still the membranes uh, and the uh, fungal affection have reproliferated, and we had to make him a fecic. So this is worst case scenario. Still, you have to try with it, but it has bad prognosis because of the uh, marked uh, morbidity of the eye. We don't want to reach this by prevention, by proper uh, treatment, by taking the right decision in the proper time. I will move to another example and bear with me this sad music. And uh, this is a case. Well, she was 35, uh, two years old female teacher. She's done bilateral base, basic uh, myopia. At that hospital, they had about the infection. It was said it was a typical mycobacteria, but the patient presented for me two or three, three months later with severe photophobia, vision hand motion. She is completely miserable. It's a bilateral corneal infection. She presented with this appearance. This is her right eye. There is still melting, some infiltration, vascularization, and heating of the epithelium. Cornea is almost melt. So what to do? In such case, she has bilateral problem. It's a decision that should have been taken earlier, but I had no option but to decide to do penetrating keratoplasty in one eye. And the other eye, I opted to do fresh amniotic membrane because I had no other option. So again, this being bacterial infection, you will see 
if we remove the diseased area, I'm not doing any cauterization because I don't want to induce more inflammation post-operative. After marking with the terrifier and then freehand removal of the cornea, you can see that anterior segment is completely clear. If you compare it to the previous uh, patient, then all I had to do now is to put a graft, reform the angle of the anterior chamber to, to dissect any possible anterior sinus, peripheral anterior sinusia. And I'm not doing again any cauterization and the graft will be fixed with interrupted sutures. As I've said, I fix it first with eight zero sutures and then take the 10 zero nylon sutures should be interrupted. Again, the reason is in such cases, there is selective healing. So there is selective loosening of the uh, sutures that you will have, you need to remove in different times. If you use continuous sutures, you will be in a problem because you'll have to remove a continuous sutures where not every part is healed. Now I will move to the other eye after removing this and I opted to use amniotic membrane at that time, fresh amniotic membrane for three reasons. I cannot do another graft at the same time, risk of rejection for both is very high. Amniotic membrane is known as it has anti-inflammatory effect. It has a pain control effect. It has some, it can help healing effect, less scarring formation and some antibacterial effects because it's soaked in antibiotics as well. So all I did in the other eye, as you can see, I will scrape the uh, melting parts and I will put an overlay with the stromal side down of a fresh amniotic membrane. I'll suture it to the conjunctiva all around. It's one layer and then I'll do a tarsography and I left, I did a tarsography and left the patient. And I didn't know what really to expect, but it's, a, it's acting like a, a living contact lens. So I didn't know what to expect from the amniotic membrane, but I knew if I remove the, the, the inciting factor for inflammation and replace it by graft, usually opposite to many of the people uh, thinking, that keratoplasty, what we call hot keratoplasty, if done in the proper time, in the proper patient, the results are really long lasting and it is visual results, it's not tectonic results. We prefer to use a visual graft, not a tectonic graft in such patients. So this is the patient, the right eye, the left eye. And you can see after I opened the tarsorophy in the left eye and you can see the, uh, the graft, all the vascularization is reg regressed. All the hepic of the epithelium regressed in the graft side and even in amniotic membrane side. Why? Because you remove the factor causing inflammation, inciting vascularization and inciting melting. You can see in the left eye, this is the remnants of the amniotic membrane. All the vascularization is, and the heaping of the epithelium is decreasing and then one month post-operatively, you can see the eye is quiet. The patient is seeing well, extremely happy. She can open her eyes. And you can see in the other eye, also the, the amniotic membrane, the amniotic membrane eye, the cornea is clearing. And this is amazing. Three years post-operative, you can see, this is the eye of the graft. The patient kept seeing 2070, best corrected, so as my wife started to get very related to see subcapsular cataract. And this is, believe it or not, the eye of the amniotic membrane. This is the edge you can see is not a graft. I didn't do anything except the amniotic membrane. The edge you are seeing is where the melting was there. The cornea rebuilt itself and it became clear. These are Tiny opacity, she, this is, she can use useful vision. Actually, she can, gets also to 2070 in this eye with little posterior subcapsular cataract. Cornea is thin, but remaining clear. And you can see five years plus, this is the eye of the amniotic membrane, how it 
it helped. And this tells you, plus the corneal cross-linking, which is a great advantage, we can use fresh amniotic membranes also as a tool if we're not using uh, or doing penetrating keratoplasty. It's a very useful tool, again, when you use it in the proper time. This was much more than I expected, and it was very interesting. And the, the cornea is, this is the, the cornea, the cornea is thin, it's 250 microns, and there is no ectasia. And this tells us that there's something that we have also to investigate about this, that it's not only thickness, because it's 250 microns, the thickness, very stable, and even the eye of the uh, kratoplasty is perfectly five years on. This is 10 years post-operative. You can see the graft is still clear. The cornea of the amniotic membrane is completely is clear with this very little tiny opacities. In spite of the fact that it is 250 microns and it is kept 250 microns. Actually, I was proposing to the patient to do her cataract surgery, but she said she's happy up till now. She doesn't want to do any surgery. So it's just amazing how if you take things seriously and do it in the proper time, this is important. This is another uh, case, unilateral corneal infection after, again, effective surgery, uh, LASIK surgery. And the uh, surgeon did not give enough attention. This was actually a bride. She had her wedding in two months or three months after that. She, she started to have treatment and the doctor told her, take antibiotics, general antibiotics. And she was getting worse. I saw her and she was not improving. She was following another doc when she was referred to me. And I saw her within two days, I took the decision. Something, this, as you can see, it's thinning, it's full infiltration, still central, and there is hypopion, and I don't, and it's fungal, it was aspergillus. I don't want her to go any further to, or further infiltration of the cornea. So I told her we have to operate. I told her we have good chance that we just resolve the infection, but still we might have very good vision as well. So, so I, I admitted her and the decision, the timing of the decision is important because she was consulted elsewhere again and she was told her eye has to be quiet to do the surgery. And in my opinion, this is the common mistake we do, that we defer, if the patient is not responding, we start postponing him, postponing him. The patient gets bored and then goes to another doctor and then a third doctor and so on. You have to make the decision. If you are not doing the surgery, you refer him to the, uh, uh, a surgeon, but don't waste time. Again, I'm removing all the disease part. Although she had hypopion, I did, if you remember the first case I showed with the, after PRK, you can see some of the exudates starting inside, but fortunately still not as bad this is typical sign with a fungal infection. And you can see there is, I thought first, this is cataract. Bleeding, you don't do cautery. Very rarely you do, you need to do cautery. And carefully, you can see a membrane all over the iris doing posterior, helping in posterior synechia. And I didn't want to do any cataract surgery combined with this case because it's infection. I can spread the infection to the eye. So I'm trying carefully to remove the exudates and the membrane, even removing part of this adherent material with the iris, trying to keep the conformity of the pupil, doing a prephraidectomy, although I'm not a fan of prephraidectomies, but in such cases, it is very important, post-inflammatory, post-infectious, you might need it to avoid peripheral block that can jeopardize everything. And after cleaning the anterior segment, 
I put the graft again, interrupted sutures. First fixing with eight zero uh, silk and then replaced by interrupted sutures, nylon, 10 zero nylon sutures. Actually, the patient improved remarkably, remarkably, very fast removal uh, improvement. And she was lucky that she did not need to postpone her wedding and she went uh, and she really got married because not only the infection was controlled, but actually also she, she had good vision with this surgery that I tried as much as possible to do a proper suturing to give, give her the chance to see well. And it was much less astigmatism than I, I usually get. And you can see even after two years, the graft is clear. I removed the sutures partially and now all the sutures are removed and she's happy. She's having some cataract that she will do. Uh, later on. So in conclusion, corneal infections can be a cause of blindness and severe morbidity. We should treat aggressively and in timely manner. We can save vision with knowledge and courage to take the right decision in the proper time. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Yahya, for this uh, very nice presentation. For well, love, Sarah, difficult cases, challenging cases. Uh, كالعادة يعني نجم متألق سوبر ستار as usual دكتور علاء لو حضرتك أي comments أنا بس عايز أنوه على حاجة قبل ما نخلص الميتنج إن this webinar is um, accredited from the University of Alexandria and there should be CME uh, credit uh, points for this meeting you can contact uh, the sponsoring uh, company Orchidia to know the details of the accreditation Thank you so much uh, Thank, Thank you, Dr. Yahya. Thank you, Dr. Yahya, for this uh, elaborate uh, presentation. Um, and I agree with you very much that uh, hot keratoplasty or therapeutic keratoplasty is a, is a eye-saving uh, procedure. And uh, actually, we don't know uh, what would be the outcome of the surgery, but we are trying to save the patient and you showed us uh, a number of uh, heroic procedures. Um, I, I think only the very expert uh, surgeons should do that. If, and this is a message for all the audience. Uh, don't attempt to do that unless you have a good experience in uh, keratoplasty and managing uh, infectious uh, uh, keratitis uh, because a lot of uh, complications might happen during surgery and uh, you should be ready to uh, deal with. Uh, I, I have no other comments but to uh, thank Orchidia and thank all my colleagues in this uh, meeting. Thank you, Dr. Ali. And uh, the message is uh, we don't want to reach this uh, stage actually with the with your guidance and the, the guidelines you have showed we can treat and then we move into cross-linking that can bridge the gap and really if we properly use it in the proper time we can avoid avoid this delay and if we see a patient that is not responding it's better to refer to a more experienced uh, surgeon that he can do a, a take a decision or do a surgery in without wasting time most of these patients have gone around for one, two, three months, and this is the normal scenario. So, okay. I, mm. I let would me, like... Uh, let me, uh, sorry for interrupting. Uh, let me and stress this point uh, for you, from your own experience and Dr. Ahmed's experience. If you are treating a patient with the resistant uh, microbial keratitis, uh, when do you decide to do therapeutic keratoplasty after how much time of medical, maximum medical treatment? How much do you give the patient until you decide to do either therapeutic or uh, therapeutic keratoplasty or uh, PAC uh, CXL? Dr. Uh, how much time? Dr. Ahmed. Uh, sorry, I was answering some questions. And, uh, when to start the therapeutic uh, PK or, uh, or dark after the infection subsided not less than six months. Of course, even with the cross-linking, 
um, طبعا no. with the pack six months thinking, no. not, not less than six months no. you have I, to I, wait I, I don't agree يعني in my opinion this is too late for you are talking about catoplasty after uh, the subsidence of infection or لا 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 it's not the question the question is how the refractory microbial keratitis not responding to treatment to medical how treatment. much do you yes. wait until you do a therapeutic keratoplasty لا طبعا if it is not responding I'm doing it immediately uh, as a hot keratoplasty طبعا yes. I never ever wait because uh, if you wait definitely this uh, infection will go through the whole um, organs of the eye So hot keratoplasty, I do believe in the hot keratoplasty as long as there is no response to infection uh, to antibiotic. And the point is, uh, the, um, how early should you be? Uh, what I mean is, the earlier the better if there is no control for infection. And, and number one is antibiotic and uh, the regular treatment, no response, uh, immediate um, cross-linking. But sometimes you may find that the ulcer is perforated So this early perforation is a very bad sign. You cannot cross-link on perforated cornea. So this needs immediate uh, keratoplasty, of course. I agree, Dr. Uh, Ahmed. I agree with you now. <laughs> uh, the, the, about <laughs> Sorry, the I didn't uh, get the question uh, first time. Uh, the question, I, yeah. I agree, I agree completely. But let's also, Dr. Ala, not uh, related to time. In the sense is, uh, we, we cannot say it. two weeks, three weeks, one week. No Depends time. on following the patient. Mm. Like the last patient I showed, I was seeing her deteriorating in spite of taking a specific treatment in front of my eyes. You, see, you should definitely see these patients every day. Sometimes you can see them twice per day even. So yes. I was seeing her deteriorating. So I can do it. The, the, to answer, you can do it after one week if it is not responsive and deteriorating. You can see the infiltration size and depth is increasing, intraocular infiltration is increasing, about to perforate. Then you have to take a decision because if you wait, you can do it after one week. Normally, you will give it, yeah, I think two weeks will be a good time to say is the treatment working or not. Mm -hmm. Um, this is a more clear answer. Uh, I mean, it depends on the situation of the patient or the, exactly. the deterioration of the condition. But uh, sometimes we are different as doctors and we are different as personalities. Some doctors are so uh, surgery oriented and some doctors are uh, more medically oriented. But I want to be, uh, to give the, the audience a guide, Yani, uh, uh, when it is, the proper time to intervene therapeutically and uh, do a, a surgery. Uh, first, uh, you know, a fungal infection not responding after a month of medical treatment and enlarging. So you have to go on and do uh, uh, keratoplasty before more complications happen. Uh, perforation also, of course, is an indication for intervening with surgery. And also, as you have mentioned, Dr. Yahya, el, uh, the, you see that it is deteriorating in front of your eyes and you can't do anything. So the message is don't wait a lot. Don't wait uh, much before complications happen. That's all. Okay. Yes, uh, okay. Farhan, cool. the whole point is uh, decision making. When to decide, when to, to be very precise in decision. This definitely, as you said, Dr. Ala, It differs from one patient to another. So early uh, corneal ulcer, you started your antibiotic, no improvement, don't wait, immediate cross-linking. If there is deteriorating, markedly starting to melt, immediate keratoplasty. So it depends on the, on the situation and the progression of the infection. And uh, um, while you are waiting more, you are losing time. Don't convince yourself that it is improving, no. It's improving when the pain decreases, when the scar starts to be uh, seen uh, early. But if there is no response to treatment, please immediately take your decision whether to do uh, yes. cross-linking or to do the keratoplasty. So early. have a clear, a clear scheme. Uh, you are asking about a clear scheme? There is no clear scheme for that. Uh, Yahya, we lost uh, the connection. Yeah. Uh, we lost here yeah, before Yahya. 
Uh, anyway, uh, I think this issue is a little bit uh, yani, uh, debatable. It differs from one Debatable to when to intervene, uh, but uh, the message is clear. Big four complications happen, and to stop patients' misery, also the patient is yes. in pain and uh, mm. is um, suffering financially also because of the lot of treatment preparations of and drugs. Mm. So uh, it's a multifactorial decision. You have to yes. put a lot of factors That's into consideration and then decide. Uh, I think Dr. Yahya is um, lost yes, in action. Something wrong. Yes. But, uh, we can conclude finish. now. Mm. We can Please. conclude. You can conclude, yes. Dr. Ahmed. Shukran, Thank you so much for uh, this uh, very fruitful webinar. I'm delighted that we still have about 288 participants since we started, which is really a big number after this gush of webinars. Thank you for uh, eye care, Dr. Yahya. Thank you for Orchidia. Thank you, Dr. Ale, for being with us. And thank you for all of you for staying with us. And the link for the webinar will be ready through, the, through Orchidia uh, after finishing the webinar. Thank you so much and see you again later. Uh, stay thank home, you. Stay here. Thank you. Bye-bye. Good night. Hello, doctor. Greetings from Orchidia Pharmaceutical. I hope you, your family, and all your beloved ones are safe and in good health. Based on your trust in Fortimox in managing ocular bacterial infection and post-operative cases, today I'm going to talk about the outstanding and unique combination Fortimox Plus, which is prescribed for ocular surface infections combined with inflammation as bacterial conjunctivitis and lid infections as calisone, sty, and blepharitis. Also, Fortimox Plus is the safest combination because it's a self-preserved ophthalmic solution with less side effects on IOP. Thank you for your time. Hello, doctor. Great.